This is a really cool episode coming up. I was interviewed by my friends at Coach Catalyst. Uh, they have a really cool business going on with software uh, for gym owners. And they interviewed me uh, at length. It was, uh, I think, a 90-minute uh, interview with me. And they're doing something cool with the show. They're kind of making it like a How I Built This type of podcast where they're going deep into how people's businesses got started and what they did to grow them and everything like that. So it's a little different than the podcasts I've done before. There's a lot of different roads that I go down, uh, some stuff that you've never heard from me before. So hopefully you enjoy this episode uh, with me on the Coach Catalyst podcast. Thanks so much. Hey everyone, welcome to the Coach Catalyst Podcast. This show is about helping you grow as a coach by standing on the shoulders of giants. Each show, you get a different mentor in your ear. The early motivations, the successes, the failures, the tools, the tricks, and the insight into where the industry is going. All of it so you can make your own dent in the world. Remember, success leaves clues. Now, without further ado, on to the show. Greetings from Copper Mountain, Colorado. This is the Coach Catalyst Podcast, and I'm your host, Trevor Whitwer. On today's episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with the one, the only, Vince Gabriel. Now, Vince and I go way back. We were in a mastermind together many, many, many years ago, and his current business venture was just a twinkle in his eye. I've had the pleasure over the course of those years watching his business grow into an absolute behemoth where he's, where he's helping coaches all over the United States, gyms all over the United States change the game. Now, this podcast isn't just about where Vince is at now. We want to hear the story about Vince, and that takes us back all the way to FQ10 as an intern in San Diego and eventually moving across the country to do his own thing in Jersey. We get into all of that along with the lessons learned and the vulnerability and what he would have done differently if he could do it again. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy this episode with Vince Gabriel. Vince Gabriel, welcome to the Coach Cattles Podcast. Thanks for having me, brother. Man, it's good, to have, it's good to have you on. So just to give a little background with Vince. So I first met Vince uh, in a mastermind uh, that we were both in. And I think that was the first time I was really exposed to you. I, I kind of knew about your gym and your facilities. It has a special lore to it. So I kind of heard about that through the through the grapevine, but actually really started to get to know you in that mastermind. Um, and that was before, actually, what you're doing now is probably in its very infancy at that point and now has blown up into much bigger um, and better things. But let's let's go back, like let's go way back because you, you started, you got your feet wet really in the trenches in the gym industry, but maybe even before that, I know you're a high level elite college football player is that how your interest in fitness uh, came into play? No. Uh, well, it, it's interesting. I, I've been writing about this a little more recently um, because I, I recently just acquired uh, a new company. And I'm not really at liberty to talk about uh, what it is yet. But um, I've been adjusting like my bio and rewriting the bio because when people – see that I acquire the company, they'll be going to my website right. and bio and things like that. So, um, so I've been rewriting the story actually, uh, very recently. And I guess you could say that it doesn't really start in college. It starts in sixth grade where I got the nickname bounce back Vinny. And I was, you know, a fat chubby football player that actually had to lose I think 30 or 40 pounds as a sixth grader to play for the eighth grade team. <laughs> so because so they had a weight limit or what? Do, do you understand that? Yes. There, as a sixth grader, I had to play on the weight on the eighth grade team because of the weight limit. But I also, as a sixth grader, had to lose <laughs> 30 pounds to play at the eighth grade limit. So that's how like bad and fat I was. Um, so it was kind of like my first, uh, uh, introduction into fitness. My mom gave me these like diet pills and was like telling me to run around the block and, you know, right. eat rice, eat rice cakes. Right. <laughs> and that was like the, the first really, uh, step into fitness. Um, but the bounce back of anything was interesting cause I just got teased so much because at one point I ran into the, the, the blocking sled 
and I, right. <laughs> I ran into it and I bounced back and I flipped over three times. And then I, they got the nickname for the rest of the season, Bounce Back Vinny. So I had nothing to do with like bouncing back and being positive. I had anything right. to do with me hitting that sled <laughs> and flipping over three times and then them calling me Bounce Back Vinny the rest of the season. Um, but that, that was like – so I was – my football career didn't start well. Uh, it ended okay. I mean, I, I ended up – I played football in high school, did pretty well, and I got a scholarship to play uh, offensive line at Temple University. And the journey to the fitness industry started when I was, I was 300 pounds uh, when I played. And the journey to the fitness industry came when I stopped playing. Uh, I had to lose weight because I was moving to San Diego and was, didn't want to take my shirt off at the beach, you know, as a, as a fat offensive lineman. So I ended up losing like, I think 60 pounds in three or four months or something like that. And what did you, what was, did you major in college? So I majored in, uh, Offensive guard. Um, <laughs> a D, you were a D1 athlete. <laughs> you know, I was – so my undergrad degree is in business, which is okay. interesting, right? But, you know, there's not – I mean, obviously, I'm, I teach business now, right? But there's right. not one thing I learned in business school that I've used <laughs> – to teach, right? He's almost self-taught, um, but my technical degree is in business. Um, okay. So, yeah. So what, what took you to San Diego then? Was it just the, the uh, nice I, weather I, and beautiful women or what? Yeah, I, I went, uh, I built a, when my, with my church when I was in, I think, uh, sophomore in high school, I went uh, to Mexico, to Tijuana to build houses mm -hmm. in Mexico. And we stayed in Point Loma, which is the San Diego area, um, before we went down to Tijuana. And I was like looking around as a sophomore in high school. I was like, this is the coolest place in the world. Like, and I vowed that day that I will live in San Diego one day. And I just was like, man, this is the time. Like I was finished playing football. I had one mere year of school left and I didn't really want to stay in Philadelphia to do it. And so I was like, I'm going right. to San Diego. So I actually uh, finished my last year at University of San Diego, uh, the fighting Toreros and um, finished my degree there. And while I was finishing my degree, it was too late to change to like exercise science or anything like that. But while I was finishing my degree, I got an internship okay. at a gym called Fitness Quest 10. Um, this guy named Dirk Todd Durkin's Durkin. Gym. Yeah, Todd, Todd's gym. Um, where I got it, just a random, in, I was just like randomly searching online and saw this, oh, this guy's from Jersey, you know, so it's Jersey guys got to stick together. So um, I just went in, applied for an internship, didn't, I like, worked for free, you know, for several months and then ended up like getting hired on and I grew, um, I founded the Fitness Quest 10 football program and then the, after that, the NFL combine training program. And mm -hmm. I was like, kind of quickly became, you know, a go-to trainer in San Diego where I was training. I mean, you look at my client list and, and you know, one, I mean, when, when, no one knows these guys anymore, right? But it was like, you know, back in the day, you knew who Donnie Edwards was, you knew who Luis Castillo were, like these guys were all my yeah. clients that I worked with. So it was kind of cool. It was really a cool thing um, that I was, what I was doing, but I kind of started as a trainer you know, working for another gym, but I kind of always had the aspiration to, um, open my own gym. That's like mm -hmm. when I got, you know, when I, when I put my head down and told my dad who was in finance that I was going to be a personal trainer. And I told him what the average salary was for a personal trainer. Um, he was like, okay. And my dad was never like, you want to like, no, you have to do this. You have to do that. Right. I was like, okay. And he wanted me to learn from my mistakes and, you know, so I could kind of tell from his reaction that's okay. I probably should actually own a gym, you know, if I'm going to stay in this industry. So he never told me that I could just tell by his face. <laughs> right. <laughs> Par parents have a really good way of telling us what they yeah. want to tell us without actually telling us that. Exactly. Yeah. So how long were you at, uh, FQ 10? Uh, five years. And it gave me the two greatest gifts of my life. And I'm very grateful to Todd for this. Um, more gifts than this, but I got a career where mm -hmm. this has been my whole career. I mean, literally, I've right. been doing this since 2003. So I've been in the fitness industry for th Almost 20, 20 years. years yeah. yeah, 20 years. Um, and then I met my wife 
Vanessa, who was a, a Pilates instructor at Fitness Quest Time, who got there a few months before me, and we ended up getting married. And then we have three kids. So I have a lot of gratitude towards Fitness Quest 10 for giving me a, a career, a 20-year career, and a, and right. a wife, a wonderful wife, amazing wife, and and three kids. So I mean, I'm happy. Yeah. And you convinced her to move back to Jersey? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's an impressive I, feat in and of itself. Yeah, I was pretty honest. You know, with her, I told her what I wanted to do from the get go. We were actually pretty good friends before we started dating. Mm -hmm. And so, but we would always talk about that. And I would say, yeah, this is my plan. This is my plan. I, my, my plan was very clear. Uh, when, even from when I started as an intern, my plan was very clear. I'm going to move back to New Jersey and open my own gym. And kind of like when I have my eyes set on something, I just go do it. Um, so she knew that that's what it was. And when we, <laughs> when we started dating at that Tom Petty concert, that <laughs> um <laughs> well, i told her i was like hey you know if this goes anywhere you're gonna find yourself living in new jersey <laughs> so yeah that everyone everyone always asks that um but it's funny we go back and we have a great time we were just back right. um recently and we have so many friends out there and we love going right. back and oh that's so, awesome yeah. So when you, so you're working at FQ10 and then you're like, all right, I want to, I know I have my sights on this, this gym thing. So did you move back to Jersey? No clients, no nothing. God, I'm going to go get a lease on a space and I'm going to just try and figure this thing out. Or did you kind of like slow play into it, build a client base first and then ultimately move into a gym? Yeah, I slow played into it. Um, I, I always joke and I always say this on my webinars. I, before I opened up one gym, I opened up five. And essentially the five gyms were, you know, two high school fields, one gym right. where I rented space. I, I used to rent space at a gym. I would pay the guy 10 bucks to train my clients. It was awesome. Like old school. Um, I would, I had a setup in my mom's basement cause Vanessa and I were living at my parents' house, which is a complete disaster. Please never, ever, if you get married, do not move into your parents' house by any means. Do not please take it from personal experience. So, but I had a setup in my mom's basement. Uh, she had like, you know, my dad was one of those guys that would buy all these like TV infomercials and like never <laughs> use it once. So there's all kinds of shit like that, like flying around. Yeah. Um, and then, um, well, and then I would train kids outside, like in parking lots. Like there's right. pictures of me like throwing medicine ball, like, having kids throw medicine balls yeah. over like electrical wires <laughs> right? and uh and hoping they'll get shocked but uh yeah so that was it so i did that for a year um and then opened my first uh facility so that first year was great because i was like super profitable i was like living right. at home i was getting like <laughs> people are like coming up to me and like handing me checks on the field crumpled up checks like kids right. like you know guys coming with big wads of cash it was like it was awesome from a business standpoint yeah. one of my more profitable years um you know on the field and then uh you know got like got uh, a facility uh so, so it's like were, 2007 were you was that yeah were you always a numbers person? And so were you like, okay, once I hit X amount of revenue, nah. then I can open a facility or was it like, ah, I think I got enough. Let's go do it. No, I, I was like kind of looking for a space at the same time. Uh, I, I, I was okay. like all in, I was all in, I knew what I wanted to do. And I was like, failure to me was not an option. Um, so I was looking, it just, it took me that long to find a space. I would have probably gotten okay. into a space uh, a little bit sooner. Um, but yeah, no, I knew that that's, that's what I wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. the, the entire time, but no, I was not like super, I'm more, much more connected to the numbers now than mm -hmm. I was then. Like I was not a numbers guy at all. Um, I was a ring the register guy. I was like, you know, Hey, I knew how to, you know, network really well. I knew how to, you know, you know, train people really well and get results really well. So that's what grew my business in the beginning. It had nothing to do with like, looking at metrics and stuff that that all all that stuff that i teach now came very much later right. um because i was like uh, how would you like i was a trainer like that's what i knew i knew how to train clients and mm -hmm. then the what grew the business was my passion and 
hard work and that's like, had nothing right. to do with like what I really knew about business in the very, in the very beginning, at least. Right. It was all just working. And so, so you move into your own kind of your own space. Was ever like, oh crap! Now I have a you know X lease that I, I have come and do, and I've got electrical bills, and I've got other utility. Like, I mean, was there a moment like, hey, I need a bunch more people in order to make this thing work because my take home just got cut big time. Yeah, um, I was fortunate in that we did so well in the very beginning. I ended up, I trained a lot of athletes in the beginning. Okay. Um, we really didn't, we trained some adults, but mostly athletes. Um, and I had run these two different camps and I, I did some very illegal things, uh, you know, in leading up to this, like I, I ended up getting like, I, I think I might've been responsible for getting someone fired, like a football coach fired. Like this guy ended up like, sending out a letter on the like the school the like letterhead that was like officially promoted by the 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 the, the board of education <laughs> that went out to like every home in the community i was like there's no way that this was actually allowed right. and um but that like i ended up like getting some like massive promotions like that um that helped me fill a bunch of camps i had tons of kids in these camps so I'm like training these kids on fields. And then that was the summer before I opened. And a lot of the kids that went into camps came in. So I started with a good amount of kids. Here's where it got um, challenging. Um, it got challenging in the change of the seasons, mm -hmm. right? So then all of a sudden you're like, you're training a lot of kids in the summer and then the fall comes and they're like, everyone goes to play a sport and they're like, you don't know how to market at that point. So you're like, where'd everybody go? And well, everyone's playing their sport. And they're right. like, oh shit, like now what to do? And then the winter comes and it's like, oh, here comes everyone's coming back. And then the spring's like, well, where'd everybody go again? And there was like these fluctuating, very challenging times from an athlete focused business. It was just very up and down and very based on the seasons. Right. And that was a real challenge. And that was very nerve wracking as a business owner to like all of a sudden do really because I didn't know how to manage cash at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. I didn't understand that if I collected a crap ton of money one month, that mm -hmm. there may not be that exact amount coming the next couple months. Right. And it's just like, right. uh, it's just like, oh, cool. I got a lot of money right now. I never see this much cash. I mean, the most money I ever made at Fitness Press, <laughs> I think, was 37,000 bucks in a year. Right. And right. so like I was at that point when I'm doing these camps and stuff, I was making money and seeing money in my account. But I didn't realize that like you can't just like look at your bank account as a snapshot in time. It's like, oh, man, I'm killing it. And then all of a sudden, right. two months later, you spend a bunch of that money and it's like, oh, no. So um, my financial education, you know, came later on when I met. Uh, well, when I started working with my best friend in the world, Mike Waldron, who is the CFO for uh, – Carmel Valley, which is the, he is the robo CFO to some of the top gyms in America. Uh, you know, if we mentioned their gyms names, you would know them, but Mike Waldron is the financial mind behind this. Mike started working with me in 2010 when I was broke in the parking lot telling him, it's just like, dude, I thought I was killing it. And now all of a sudden, you know, I took all my money out of the business, put a down payment on a house and like just made stupid financial mm -hmm. decisions because I didn't know what I was doing. And Mike taught me, you know, uh, gave me a financial education. He taught me that, hey, there's this thing called the profit and loss statement. And that's the thing that tells you how much money you made and how much money you spent. And you should look at that, Vince. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, it's just, I was just like, no, I have money. Yep, let's go. Uh, just, so it, 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 right. my, and so my financial education came out of need. It came out of failure, right? Because I did well in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, I was not good at managing money. I was not good at, you know, looking at leading indicators and looking at the profit and loss statement. And, um, I was a dumb, I mean, at one point I probably spent like 
20 grand in a month on pieces of equipment that I didn't need. Like I bought a, right. I remember one month I was like in a Louis Simmons kick and I bought a belt squat, a reverse hyper and a, uh, what was the other one? Belt squat. It was a belt squat. It was a reverse hyper and it was a uh, glued ham raise, which is not a bad glued purchase. Ham, yeah. But, but glued ham is like, you know, how many adults over 40 can do one glued ham raise? Like zero. <laughs> no. Like they, none right. of them can do any. Right. Right. So it's like, it was that actually a really good purchase. And we had some athletes that could do it. But let's like, so here I was like taking this money that I have and just investing in equipment that only one person can use one time. I didn't think about business right. systems. I just thought about, oh, this is cool. I want one of these. And mm-hmm. I remember like, uh, you know, like talking to the, uh, to the sales rep at the company I bought it from and his sales pitch was, you know, what well, the belt squad, I'm going to buy the belt squad. It's like, it's for people that have like bad backs and squats. He's like, yep, that's what it's for. And, and I was like, all right, yeah, let's buy that. <laughs> it's just like, what is with that? If I could just watch myself as a 27 year old idiot trainer and the dumb decisions I made, oh man, I could just smack myself upside the head so many times. So, uh, but yeah, so I definitely, I, you know, a lot of times people hear my story and think it's this like trajectory of success the right. entire time. And it was not that. I mean, if you, if you want, I mean, I got a laundry list of stuff. I mean, Vanessa, and I pretty much got divorced my first year. We split up. She moved back to California. Um, I, after two years of success, I pretty much ran out of money and had to like go to my dad for more money. It was the most embarrassing thing ever. I was like, oh, dad, I'm like, I, I was like, didn't, you know, so it's like, I went through a lot of, uh, in the beginning, you know, it was like very like up and down, um, success. And even throughout, you know, I think I had another, you know, area of time where, um, I, we ended up kind of coming back strong from it. And then I ended up another, and I'm kind of like airing all my dirty laundry here, but I went through a period where we did really well and had success. And I built this awesome team. Um, Mm -hmm. and we had this really, really great, I mean, I'm talking like really good trainers. I had a front office guy that was really good, but it got to the point where I was still not finding as financially savvy as I needed to be to look at payroll and the percentage Mm -hmm. of payroll relative to revenue. And my payroll just kept going up and up and I was paying people more and more and more. And then, um, we weren't as good as marketing as we needed to be. So when we lost people, we weren't able to reload. So we ran into trouble there. So, you know, there was a lot of periods of time of running it as a gym owner that, you know, I really, I was a f- failure. I was really not doing well at all. And, but, but all those challenges and all those times taught me, you know, so much about one, about coming back, right? I've mm-hmm. had a lot of times where I have to go back into my business and really get things going, get things cranking. Um, and I realized as a business coach, that's one of my best assets, right? You know, as, as me helping a lot of gym owners now, it's like, all right, I've, you know, seen this before, I've been here before and here's what I would do differently and mm-hmm. stuff. So as challenging as that stuff was in the very beginning, um, you know, it, it, you know, and, and it didn't feel like that at the time, but it's been hugely helpful, you know, mm-hmm. to, to, to help people, um, in their journeys, uh, as, as gym owners. So if you, if you were young Vince's business coach, knowing what you know now, how would you have suggested that he kind of start this thing maybe the right way or differently? What kind of advice would you give him? Yeah. Um, so in the very beginning, I was very athlete heavy and the challenge on being athlete heavy is there's not a lot of recurring revenue, right? Mm -hmm. There's block revenue, there's seasonal revenue and it's very challenging and, and uh, stressful to a business owner to not have recurring revenue to start a month at zero. Like, I don't know how like these chiropractors, even physical therapists, like they start at zero every month. It's that's, that's gotta be nerve wracking and you gotta be damn good at marketing. Right. You know, to be able to do that. So I I would probably say if I could go back to myself, I mean, there's so many things, but I would say step one is I probably would have um, created, whether that was athletes or adults, I don't, it's, you can do it with athletes. It's just harder. 
right? Mm-hmm. But I would probably have a, a, a stronger base of recurring revenue um, and probably have shifted towards uh, the small group model um, earlier on. In, in, were, um, were you selling sessions for your athletes or was it like one month here, one month there, kind of no long term? Or was it like a three month block? How were you, how did you structure that early it on? Was a three, it, it was a three month block, which I'm not against, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not against the three month block. It, it, it's actually, and we can get into this later, but so I relaunched my sports performance program under a different brand mm-hmm. called Grit and it's, it's killing mm-hmm. it. It's doing really well. Um, and we still do a block system there. Um, but the reason is we have a base of recurring revenue with our adults. And right. that is a, the stability, you know, from there, where mm-hmm. if you have a bad quarter with athletes, um, you still have a base of recurring revenue from your adults. So I would say, you know, there's so many things I would tell, you know, dumb Vince, you know, when he started. But, you know, one of them would be you need a base of recurring revenue. Right. You want to build a base of recurring revenue that outpaces your expenses. Mm-hmm. And you just you just put yourself in a stronger financial position from that. Number two is you have to look at um the numbers and look at very important numbers like um how how much your payroll is relative to to your revenue. If all of a sudden your payroll is like sixty percent of revenue, it there's only not gonna be any profit left over. And that would probably be the other thing I would say to young Vince, who is very revenue heavy, revenue yeah. focused, right? You know, I was, I was like, a, 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 I wanted that million dollar gym, man. I mm-hmm. wanted it. I want seven figures. I want to grow. And I would say, who cares? You know, focus on being a profitable business. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why I think that, you know, and I, I was out in San Diego um, this past week meeting with my CEO mastermind and we meet four times a year and we look at profit and loss statements four times a year. And we've been doing this. I've been with this one group for almost four years now. And we look at these P and L's every quarter and they just keep getting more profitable, more profitable, profitable. And because one, we've decided to focus on being profitable businesses. And two, we look at it every quarter. And so Mm -hmm. I probably would have said to myself is yeah, revenue is great. But profit is what matters at the end of the day when it's left over. So I would look at how how do you um, make decisions based around profit over ringing the register. Now, hey, there's a point in time where you got to be able to ring the register, and that's where marketing comes in, which is really like my mm-hmm. first love and the thing I love most and love to teach to gym owners the most because it's where they struggle. Um, so there's always the time to ring the register, but at the end of the day, you know, the money you get to keep is, is the profit, you know, not the revenue. Right. So I would say to myself, I would be a more profit focused gym owner than I was uh, when I started. So you, I mean, you get the privilege to look behind the curtains on a lot of really, really well run gyms um, in the United States and kind of all over. And so two things, one, we talked about kind of percentage of payroll. I know some other people have kind of certain percentages of total revenue that should go to payroll. Have you found a nice range that you find is really profitable or is a good spot for gyms to be in where you're able to provide the service and the experience you want, but also, you know, not do too much? Yeah. And obviously this is coming from Mike Waldron, who I mentioned earlier, but he likes no more than 40%. Mm -hmm. So 40% is kind of the high end. Um, So 25 to 40%. And that number excludes owner pay. Uh, That's always a question that people ask um, that excludes owner pay. And owner pay is kind of like a a stickier situation. A lot of it depends on, too, is how much the owner is doing in the business. Um, If the owner is training 30 sessions. Yeah, let's say they're training 30 30 sessions. Do, Do you consider that in that payroll or do you exclude that out? So if they're doing a lot of work in the business, then they should pay themselves fairly for that. So that would be included. But if it's an owner's draw, like they're taking a salary just for Mm -hmm. being the owner, that would be excluded. The problem is a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people don't pay themselves like that fair wage and they just take random draws here and there. And that's kind of what ends up getting them messed up. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to look at what would it cost to replace yourself, right? Right. If you were training 30 hours, 
you know, you technically mm-hmm. should be paying yourself that 30 hours, you know, for mm-hmm. training those sessions, F- pay yourself fair market rate, right. For training those sessions, pay yourself fair market rate for that. And then, um, and then you win off the, uh, off the profit after that. So or it would ex- that 25, so you would be including that 25 to 40%, mm-hmm. but it would exclude like a draw, the draw that you would take as an owner. Okay. Yeah. So the other question around that that I think is interesting and, and people probably need better answers to is there's kind of inflection points, right, with a business. I've gotten to a certain point with the staff that I have, but maybe there's more to be had, but I don't have people to be able to do that. And this, so this idea of, well, I need to kind of overhire right now because I'm going to grow and that will allow me to grow versus like growing and then my systems kind of fall apart and I can't provide a great service and then trying to hire. How would you advise a coach that's kind of at one of those inflection points where they're like, I kind of need to hire to keep my experience, but I maybe don't have a ton to give away. How would you, how would you coach that coach? Yeah. I, I, Mike Boyle has a great line and he basically says, if you know the rules, you can break the rules. And so I think you want to set up these types of boundaries to look at um in, in terms of like what you're willing to put out in payroll but in a situation like you're talking mm-hmm. about i look at it as hey there's times to make investments in the business and if that temporarily brings you over a what you're comfortable with um but you're foreseeing getting a return on that investment in the future then it's probably a really good decision to do i think what you got to really look at it as things in 3 month trends Right. So all of a sudden, if, if three months goes by and you're creeping up and you're creeping up and you're creeping up and mm-hmm. you're, here you are, there's a trend now of your payroll being at 50 percent. Right. That's probably something you don't want to do. But if it's right. like you making a decision of, hey, I'm going to hire a marketing person. Right. And I'm going to invest a fifty thousand dollar salary. Right. To. So I'll give you an example. Like I did this, you know, when we were in uh, the pandemic. Um, I shut down our sports performance program because we couldn't get kids to do mm-hmm. anything online. And honestly, at that point of the, um, of the business, it wasn't really doing well anyway. And I kind of was focused on adults and honestly focused mostly on consulting and stuff like that. So I essentially, you know, just said, we're not during COVID, we're shutting it down. And I ended up bringing it back under a new name, new brand I mentioned called grit. Mm-hmm. And at the point when I brought it back, there was no revenue at all in that program because I was starting it almost like a new business. But my point was I wanted to find the right person to run it. And so what I did is I went out and I recruited a guy to run the program and there was no money coming in. And I hired him in January and the Mm -hmm. program, we weren't going to launch till like March or something like that. And so I paid him a $50,000 salary. So month by month. So I think I invested 12 grand in him before I made any money. Mm -hmm. on that. And that was one of the best investments I've ever made because the program now is like phenomenally well, phenomenally successful right now. But that's an example of an, I was almost going in the hole to make Mm -hmm. this investment in this person to be able to see the future. And that's, I guess, the biggest thing that people need is they need a vision, right? They need a vision for where they're going. Um, The number one job of the CEO is to have clarity on point A to point B. Right. Mm-hmm. That's really what our job is as the owners of our company is clarity of where you were now, what is real, what is real, what's happening right now. And that's what I do in, in all their CEO meetings. We get in front of the room and they tell us, all right, here's what, here's where we're at. Here's reality. This is how many clients we have. This is how much they're paying. This is our revenue. This is our profit. Like this is reality right now. And then we say, okay, well, where do you want to be in 12 months? Right. And then they tell us where they want to be in 12 months. And then we build in the gaps you know, um, from there, but th- it's hard to make those kinds of decisions, um, like investing in a staff member. Um, if you don't have a clear cut picture of where you're going mm-hmm. and why you're actually doing that. So clarity on point B, A to point B is huge. So kind of coming back to your, your journey, then you were mainly athletes early on. Was there a point where you're like, Hey, I need more stability <laughs> over the entire year. And so you started to branch out to adults or was it like, Hey, parents just started coming in and it's like, okay, we'll run with this for a while. Was that a conscious decision or just kind of like a, you know, what happened? No, it's a good question. It was a very conscious decision. It was getting sick and tired of the 
anxiety of the seasons, right? Mm -hmm. And wanting to go all in on this base of recurring revenue. And I viewed that the adults were, was, that was going to make that happen. And we were doing adults, but we were kind of had this athlete identity. Mm -hmm. And so we made a very conscious decision that we even changed our color scheme from red to blue. Um, red being more of a color of action, blue being the color mm -hmm. of trust. Um, so we changed our, our not a, a subtle change, but nothing crazy. Um, and we changed, you know, our messaging. We changed that's when we really got into marketing and we made that shift around where we basically became a gym that focuses on training adults over 40 to help them lose mm -hmm. weight, gain energy and live a more active life. And that was what we became known for in the community. And all of our marketing went towards that. And the athlete, you know, was a side thing. It became a side thing that we still did, but the focal point became going all in on this adult population. Um, now that went really well and we grew our adult population, you know, tremendously. Um, in in hindsight, the one thing I think if, if I'm advising someone to do that today, if you have a split business, the which is what a lot of people follow, that follow me actually do. They have a split business in terms of athletes and adults. There is a way to mm -hmm. do it simultaneously, right? A lot of what happens, and this happened to me, a lot of times you go all in on one and then you lose the other. Um, right. And the way to win it both is to put the right person in charge. And so if, let's say you're going to step in at your gym and you're going to go all in on this adult thing, right? Yep. In order for you, if you're also in charge of getting the athletes and growing the athlete program um, and you leave that to yourself, you're probably not going to make it happen. And so the, mm -hmm. the, the, the mistake I made and the um, advice I give now is to have um, – basically a program director or program leader, whatever you want to call it. We, and this could go either way, um, but someone needs to be in charge of that and potentially be compensated to grow mm -hmm. that program. Um, so that's what I've done with, with here. And mm -hmm. that's when it finally kind of all came together and both were able to move at the pace I wanted them to move. Right. Um, so, that's kind of how if someone was to do that, they would do that. But yes, to answer your question, it was a very conscious decision. Right. And it really, ended, at the end of the day, ended up being a marketing decision. And at this time, how many people, how many people are working with you? How many employees do you have kind of when you're making that shift? Is it just a handful? Uh, probably had like seven trainers at the time. Okay. I think seven trainers. So. And I mean, let's go back even a little bit further. When did you make your first hire and why did you make that hire? Uh, uh, first hire was pretty much pretty close to right away. Because okay. um, I had, we also were training a bunch of teams at the time. Um, yeah, my first hire was, I think, you, you, have you met Big Tom? Yeah, yeah, I know Tom. Yeah. yeah, so my first hire was Big Tom. He was six foot nine. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the story is the story of my first hire is actually very informative. Um, I, it was between Big Tom and another guy. And the other guy was actually, I still know him. He's a really good dude. Um, but this guy was a, he, he had like, I remember athletes performance before it was, yeah. um, what, are you, what is it called now? It's called Exos. Or so before Exos yep. was athletes performance, right? And they had that cert, right? Um, mm -hmm. And he was like certified from them. He was just like, uh, he, he, he was like the prototypical trainer. He really knew so much. And he's a really smart dude. Um, and then you had Big Tom who didn't know shit. He basically <laughs> played college football and he – maybe took a couple of graduate courses in strength and conditioning, but like really didn't know. But like I saw Tom and I just, I saw this guy that was like the six foot nine giant that, you know, he was kind of, you know, offensive linemen stick together. He was an offensive lineman like me, but he, I could tell that he had the intangibles that I wanted. I knew he didn't have the knowledge that he needed, but I could tell he had the personality that I, and the values, right. Mm -hmm. That I wanted to grow my business with. 
Whereas the other guy had the skill sets, Mm -hmm. but didn't have the same core values and didn't have the same personality as what I was looking for. And I believe that decision changed the trajectory of our business. I believe that first hire, and I think that first hire is really important because he kind of set the tone, right? Of there was me, then there was him. And then the next guy we hired, so you had two stronger people. And the next guy we hired kind of got engulfed into the culture, right? But that first hire um, was a really important one. And I think, I don't remember it being strategic in terms of, I think I was like, I honestly don't even remember. This was so long ago, but I don't remember like right. how many sessions we were doing at the time of what yeah. brought me to, I honestly, so I don't even know if I was looking. I feel like I, he came to me or something. I don't even know. Um, but you want to, you want to hire someone before you get burned out, you know, cause it's, a, it's easy to do in the very beginning is to get, is to get burned out. And uh-huh. I would probably say, I used to hear uh, people say that, um, you know, hire an admin first. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that anymore. I used to teach that. And I think if you're going to hire someone, you know, hire a trainer, like that's like, you know, how you're going to make money. They're a revenue mm-hmm. producing employee. So hire revenue producing employees as fast as possible. Um, so I would say your first hire is a trainer because the admin stuff, like, you know, how much of it, the, you got 40 members. You don't need like a full-time admin person to, work, you know, right. You can have good systems. Like and there's Catalyst systems and now. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. There's systems now. There's see, technology see, I just, now I was you giving can, you a plug and I was giving you a plug and you just talked over me and you didn't, you didn't even get it. You didn't even get it. No one knows now. Yeah. <laughs> the co- the podcast is called coach catalyst. So hopefully they get it. Um, that, I mean, that's awesome. I, I always find it fascinating. on you know, looking back on this and what we know now and would we do it differently? And I mean, obviously like oh, hindsight dude. is always twenty twenty. Yeah. but, but big Tom was what big Tom was with you for like, I mean, just very recently, like, I mean, it's over 10 years, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well over 10 years. Yeah. He started in 08 and I think he, I mean, I think he left in like during like right after COVID 20. No, he was with me, you know, right. like almost 12 years. Yeah. Great dude. Yeah. Still I mean, one of my best awesome. friends. And I yes. think, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, he's awesome. Um, I've met him a, a number of different times at your mastermind meetings. Um, okay. So we're, we're shifting into kind of adult now with the side thing being athletes has your focus now at this point kind of shifted to be more kind of business owner, CEO, or are you still in the trenches working with clients a lot, or are you starting to make that transition, um, maybe out of day-to-day operations? Uh, I, I pulled myself out of the training pretty early. Um, unlike most, I just was, I did it so much. Um, in San Diego and I just, I was just burned out from it. So I, at that point, to answer your question, um, yeah, I was in CEO role. I was also in, in the sales seat. So I was doing all the consultations. I was managing the marketing. Um, so it's like, I kind of like looked at that sweet spot for a gym owner to, to own. It's like you own the CEO role, you own the marketing role, you own the sales role, and then you find competent people to take care of the clients. Um, Mm -hmm. that's like, I look at that as like a stage two, stage three gym owner, um, that can be the CEO, but own, still own the marketing and sales seat. Um, that's essentially where I was in that, in those later years when we were really pumping into the adult population, um, from there. Um, and I honestly think that that's, you know, I talked about today on one of my mastermind calls, it's like, you got to own the sales as long as possible the marketing and the sales as long as possible. It doesn't mean you have to do everything for it, but you got to own it um, mm-hmm. because no mm-hmm. one else is going to really own it, you know, as good as, as you do. And that's, that's the right. job. It's like, there's a line in um, the book, uh, ready fire aim where he goes, um, the, the, the job of the owner is to be able to stimulate stale sales when the business needs it most. Right. And so that's mm-hmm. why I, I spent so much time teaching gym owners that because they have to have that education because of, they can't do that. No one really is going to be able to do that, especially when you're working with a bunch of trainers that don't know how to sell. Um, so yeah, CEO, sales seat, marketing seat. 
As a coach that runs challenges, I needed my life back. I had stuff all over the place. A Facebook group for community interaction, Google Sheets for check-ins and measurements, and was drowning in email communication. As my challenges grew past just a handful of people, I started to notice clients were falling through the cracks. I began researching virtual assistants because I just couldn't manage it all. And truthfully, the client experience was going down the drain. Luckily, a friend recommended Coach Catalyst and just told me to trust her. I'm sure glad I did. Now I can run my challenges with two or 200 clients with just a few clicks. The lessons get delivered on the right days, the accountability happens automatically, and most importantly, the communication is all in one spot. I even created two new challenges from the Coach Catalyst library. Best part, didn't have to change a thing. I used to spend 15 minutes just trying to log into all the apps I needed. Now I log in and my dashboard tells me who needs a shout out and who needs a kick in the butt in about 15 seconds. I feel like a huge weight is lifted off of my shoulders. I can finally spend my time coaching again instead of worrying about all the admin work. Do your brain a favor and get Coach Catalyst. So, you, I mean, you had a business, you were obviously business minded. You majored in, in football and business in college. But was there was there a large learning curve or did you find out was it something you were passionate about? Like that was an easy transition for you to make or was it like this is what needs to be done in order for the business to grow? And so I'm just going to figure it out. No, I, I believe that passion came pretty early on. I when I started doing okay. it, I think the first business book I read was The E-Myth. And yep. I that that book was probably like the thing that like told me. I have to think like a, a business owner. So that was like probably one of my most important books I've ever read because I think that set the tone early for, in my business career of how to think. And I wanted to not be the technician, right? Which you talk about the difference between the technician and the, yep. and the owner. Right? And I, I didn't want to be that. And I believe that that read was, was a hugely helpful thing. But then I also just started it became a, a passion and an interest of mine that I really enjoyed. I enjoy small business. I love talking about the local law firm and how the law firm can grow. Like I have a buddy I play basketball with and he just went from being a lawyer at a firm to opening up his own law firm. And I saw him and he's like, right. You know, he's gained 20 pounds and he's looking at me, he's all tired of shit. And I like, he comes up to me, he's like, man, this owning your business thing ain't no joke. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, dude, you should go back to being a lawyer. <laughs> right. Um, but, but, you know, it's like, I was, but I'm like super interested in that. Like I want to, I was helping him with his business and, you know, I just, I just, I love the mechanics of it. And that, that came, I guess, early for me. So it wasn't hard for me to learn about business. It was, it, it came as something that, um, which is interesting because I, when I was majoring in like business, I, like I hated all the classes, like accounting and economics and that, right. that kind of thing. I just didn't enjoy that. But like the whole, like, give me a business on main street in any town USA. And that's just, man, that just makes me come alive. That's what I love. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter the industry, obviously I love the gym space, but any industry, I just, I, that that's small, and I uh, spent a lot of time in with uh with Goldman Sachs. I did a business uh, program called the Goldman Sachs Ten Thousand Small Business Program, and they they pick. Uh, I think I was the first gym owner ever selected uh, in that program, and I broke the dress code down very. You know, it, the first the first <laughs> week, everyone was wearing suits and ties, and I showed up with like a right. flannel and you know Timberlands, and like by the end, everyone right. started dressing like me. It was actually really cool. Um, <laughs> You know, because they didn't want to like, I don't wear this stupid tie anymore, right? Um, but that was a hugely cool experience. And now I got, you know, uh, coaching from really high-end, you know, uh, executive coaches and met so many cool people. And you learned about like buying businesses and acquisitions and all kinds of cool things like this. So it was, uh, it was a great experience. But that just, that was one of the things like that just drove me to um, learn about it more and more and more. And then, you know, obviously... You know, what I've done is turn that love and that passion essentially into a whole nother business. Like it's, I mm -hmm. own a business education company where we teach gym owners how to run their business better. Um, so I essentially just took that gym, the success I had in the gym, and then created another business in the back of that. Um, that's kind of what we do all day long now. So 
kind of moving from one business to the next as kind of an entrepreneur, right? How did you make that transition? Because obviously there wasn't the business education aspect, like that had to be built from the ground up, right? And so building anything from the ground up takes a level of effort and focus and intention, which then takes away effort and focus and attention from another place because your gym is still operating. I mean, to this day, you're still involved in some capacity in your gym from time to time. And so how did you make that transition and were there were there any failures in that? I've seen a lot where someone tries something new and then they got to go back to the old thing because that wasn't doing what they needed it to do. How did it work for you as you were building this kind of next, this next endeavor, this next, uh, this next business? Yeah, it was kind of a gift. Um, I, I'm not blanking on the year, but um, I had dabbled in some coaching consulting stuff Uh you know, pretty early mm-hmm. on, but it wasn't until my dad had a stroke and I think it was like four or five years ago now. And he had a stroke and I ended up, uh, this was in August and he had a stroke in August and I ended up having to like be gone for almost two months. And, um, yeah, just like he was, it was a bad stroke. So he like couldn't walk, talk. It was like one of those bad ones. Right. So while I was like oh. out of the gym for two months, And while I'm like with my dad and, you know, with my mom and sisters and stuff, I was just gone. Um, We started like doing even better than when I was there. And we like, we're growing. And I'm like, kind of like calling him, calling Big Tom, like how things going? He's like, we're doing good. You shouldn't come back. Right. And um, I wrote my first book in the, 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 um, the waiting room of NYU hospital uh, when my dad was getting brain surgery and I would go and see him and then go into the waiting room and write. And I essentially wrote what I had done. You know, I wrote about my failures. I wrote about my successes. Um, but I looked at the things I did well. And the best, the best thing I did well was hire a good staff and hire a good team. And we had a great team. Mm-hmm. Now the, Balancing the payroll is a different story, right? But I had I had found great people, and I found yeah. I, I found good people. I was able to keep good people for a long time, um, and I had people that were just bought into the culture, right? And mm-hmm. so my first book was called "The Three Six Four Hiring Ring," and I essentially outlined how I was able to hire that kind of staff, and then I started, you know. Um, looking at what we did from a marketing standpoint, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I wrote my second book called The Ultimate Guide to Marketing Your Gym. And so mm-hmm. all the books, what launched that business, my consulting business was those books. Um, and they all came from, all the books came from personal experience, right? They it didn't come from theories. It came from, no, this is what I did. And mm-hmm. I essentially just, that's why they were so easy to write. Like I just like sat down and just like, well, how did we hire this person? Well, we did a phone interview first and then we asked them these questions and I just, I literally just outlined everything, you know, that we had success with. Um, So that's kind of what was the, it was kind of like my dad was telling me like, go art, you're good. You did well, go do your next thing. And so that's when I went and made the decision. I was like, all right, these guys got this. Things are going well. I have the time and the freedom to go and launch this other business, which I had wanted to do, but just really, Mm -hmm. you know, almost like that, you know, the fear of, you know, um, of leaving, I guess, if you will. Um, so I, 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 that's essentially what kind of started it. And obviously then I started speaking at perform better, which was huge. Um, mm-hmm. I got a couple good breaks and I got some, I, I got a speaking gig at mind body, got a speaking gig at idea. I got speaking gigs at, um, idea world, which was a huge one. I spoke in front of like 500 people. My first speaking engagement was in front of 500 people at idea world, which is like a big stage. I like, I was like followed like Darren Hardy spoke right before me. I was like, I do not belong on the stage. I was like, um, but I got lucky and, you know, did that. So that's like, so I started to get breaks like that. So I wrote some books. 
I got speaking engagements, uh, launched our podcast, the Fitness Business University podcast after that. And that's kind of what got that business off off the ground. And, you know, in the very beginning, it was a lot of it was, you know, teaching the things that we did. So we would bring people in and have them come in for two days and I would teach them stuff, you know, but then they would watch what we did and watch how our trainers trained and stuff. So it was very much of a mentorship type mm -hmm. of uh, thing in the very beginning. And now, you know, I've evolved into, all right, I'm not just a coach that says, all right, here's my gym, just copy what I do. I'm not do that anymore. Um, there's guys in my mastermind that, you know, have 10 gyms, you know, there's guys that are doing $3 million a year in revenue at their gyms. Like, so there's guys that I'm working with on a regular basis. So my business mind has had to evolve to a much higher level than just, you know, running mm -hmm. one gym. But that's kind of eventually how it started. Yeah. So did you write the books with the intention of doing the consulting or was the books yeah. just a way for you to like get everything out of your head? And No, I, I knew that I needed to write books. Okay. I knew that, that, that there was a different type of what I had learned at that point um, from studying like the Dan Kennedys of the world is that the consulting mm -hmm. idea is a very authority based business. And I needed mm -hmm. to turn myself into an authority and there's no better way to build authority on a subject than to write a book. I mean, the ultimate guide mm -hmm. to marketing your gym, I mean, is been, I've used that as my go-to lead magnet for over six years, five years, maybe. And I mean, I can't tell you how many times that book's been downloaded and every day, I mean, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get 90 downloads a week today. And the mm -hmm. book was written six years ago. Right. Um, so it's like they stand the test of time. Um, but yeah, I did know that that was like, all right, if I'm going to be in this space, I know that the books will help me build, you know, authority and people will know, start to get to know who I am. Um, and so yes, it was strategic. It was, yeah. Okay. I, there's a lot so I did that wasn't strategic. That that was one of them. That was. <laughs> I love it. Um, and so I'm really the books lead to then to the speaking because it makes it a whole lot easier to get on stage when you're like, hey, you know, I've written these books and now teaching on stage is just kind of one step from that. And that kind of builds the authority even more when you're on stage. Um, was, that the, was that the way it worked or was there another strategy in order to get to the stage? Yeah. No. Uh, so... I, I don't think like that people saw that I wrote a book and invited me to speak. I, I okay. had a friend that was putting together the idea world and she knew me and she had seen me speak at a small event in front of like 10 people. And I guess I did good. And she's like, Hey, someone dropped out. And so we need you to come in. Can you come speak in July? And I hadn't like, it was like so nerve wracking to be able to, get on stage like that because I had never done a big speech like that. Um, so that was luck. And then I'll, the the story how I got him perform better is awesome. So I was friends with Charlie Weingroff, who was, you know, on yeah. the perform better tour, who I think a lot of people know. And I had been a student at the perform better conferences for years. And I would be in the front row right. watching Martin Rooney, watching these guys, right? And I was just like there. And I knew I knew all the people there. And I called Charlie and I was like, hey, what do I need to do? I want to speak. Like I got this speaking gig at Idea. I want to go speak at Perform Better. And I was like, what do I need to do? And this was like two days before they had an event in Chicago. He said, you need to get on a plane. You need to come to Chicago. You need to talk to Chris. So I booked a flight. I actually brought Tom with me. And um, <laughs> we <laughs> the story is hilarious. So we go and, and we're at the social and Charlie is like kind of strategizing with me. It's like, here, here's like, here's what you need to do. You need to go, you know, I'll introduce you and you talk to Chris and just tell him what you want to do. And, you know, and then I'll like keep throwing a word for you. I was like, all right, cool. And so I talked to Chris and he's like, yeah, yeah, cool. You know, send me, uh, maybe send me a, a, a video of you speaking and stuff like that. That'd be cool. And then, um, so I was like, all right, cool. And so Tom and I were at the bar and, we were just like having drinks at the bar and the perform better crew comes up and they're seeing, and I had, I'd known a few of them and, um, they were like, Hey, Vince, you, you want to come to dinner with us? 
And uh, we're like, I was like, sure. And I was like, oh, this is cool. It's like, oh, the Perform Better crew invited me to go to dinner. And so we're, me and Tom are going out to dinner and I'm like, holy shit, this was like nerve wracking. Cause this is people I like idolize, like, you know, like going to right. dinner with Mike Boyle, like that's like ridiculous. Right. And so the restaurant we went to was this German place. And it was one of those places where there's big long tables and steins of beer and mm-hmm. the waitresses were all dressed mm-hmm. in these like German outfits and they would come around with these paddles. And what they would do is they would take people and they would bend them over the table and they would, these ladies would take a running start and (laughs) smack you in the ass with these paddles. And they came to the table and Poirier, Chris Poirier calls up and goes, Vince, get over there. And I'm like, all right. And I like went around, put my hands down on the table and bent over and just big German ladies go winding up and Poirier looks at me and locks eyes with me. And he goes, Vince, you want to speak on the perform better tour? He was like, if you flinch, you will never speak on this tour. He's like, if you take this like a man, I'll give you a shot. <laughs> and then she like wound up and three days smacked me right in the ass. And I was like, Oh man, I am not flinching. No way. I came this far. I'm not going to flinch. And I've been on the tour for five years now. So there you go. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So that's the, that's the secret. That's the secret. Oh, man. That's yeah. Awesome. The secret is get lucky. <laughs> that's the secret. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, well, just, uh, you know, it, it's you, be there, right? right? You know, uh, Kennedy right. has a line of, you know, be someone and then um, be somewhere. I don't, yeah. if I don't go to Chicago, I'm not speaking on Perform Better Tour. No way. Right. I had to go. I had to go and do the thing and do like, you know, um, so that, that was, and then, um, and then the mind body came, I think it was a referral from someone else. Um, speaking of mind body was really cool. Um, it was really cool. Mm -hmm. They, they do the uh, really nice events and, um, you know, there was like, I shared the stage with uh rachel hollis and michelle obama and all kinds of cool stuff so it was like really cool um to do and good resume builders from a speaking standpoint but the perform better has been the most impactful from a business standpoint just because that that crew tends to follow me if you will yeah and that's a that's an audience that is very interested in coaching and getting better and you don't go to perform better if you're not kind of all in on coaching yeah like it's yeah it's one of the better tours out there for sure yeah yeah oh, man that's awesome so all right so you kind of move out of this you're starting the new business but you're kind of a guy that can't necessarily sit still um because you've you've since kind of dabbled not really dabbled but done other businesses as well and so when you're thinking about kind of creating a new business, are you looking for synergy within here's what I'm currently doing? Here's one degree away. And, oh, I think we could bolt that on because maybe it's going to help this business and this business. Oh, you know what? It'll probably help other people too. And so we'll find the right person to head it up and then I'll support that person and it'll be, it'll be a smash. Or do you look at it differently? No, I, I mean, based on the businesses that I've built is kind of, if you look at the trajectory of all of it, it's like, okay, open a gym master mm-hmm. by running a gym, then train other people how to do it. So that started a second business. Third thing mm-hmm. was marketing, right? Interest in marketing, realizing that they need marketing more than ever. And they don't just need education. They need it done for them. And that's mm-hmm. the story of the Kiss Marketing, which is my other business, which probably will be the biz- biggest business I end up having in my life um, because it's a, a business that is scalable and a business that will be sold, you know, most likely at some point. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, that is, uh, b- but I looked at that as, okay, there was a need for the gym owners and then I fulfilled that need. So that's like business is about solving problems, right? And so... They had the mm-hmm. problem of websites and Facebook ads, and there was no one doing well with Facebook ads, as you know, right? Probably mm-hmm. you know, gone through many different agencies and you know things like that. But we wanted to create something different, and we have. Um, and the success that that business having 
is having right now is incredibly tremendous. And my business partner, Will Matheson is, you know, an unbelievable person and, and a marketer and business owner. Um, and that, that business, uh, I'm essentially an investor, right? I'm essentially, I've started that mm -hmm. business, but then, you know, all of our clients that are coming to, um, coming to our mastermind and other, you know, coaching programs, most of them become agency clients because we, they've built the mm -hmm. trust, right? So right. what it's about is really, you know, finding the problems that your market has and then creating solutions, you know, to that problem and, you know, really creating a, almost like an ecosystem where they can get everything they need, you know, mm -hmm. from you. Um, so that most likely right. will turn into other things. Um, I've built an audience and I've built trust. Uh, I've done it from what I, people tell me, uh, very authentically, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, and you can see from today, I'm been honest, very honest about, you know, about my failures and honest about the challenges that I've had in my business and life and all of that. And so I lead with a, a high degree of authenticity. And I think that ends up building a lot of trust with people. Many of the people that are in my mastermind have been in it since it started you know, five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people aren't, aren't showing testimonials from people that have been with them for five years. Most testimonials you see in right. this space are, I got 374 leads in, in 19 days. <laughs> right. Right. That's right. what you see. But I mean, I have pictures of gym owners that are, you know, on vacation with their families and credit the mastermind due to yeah. the, the length of education they've had for over a five year period. So um, that's kind of how I look at it. I look at building a business on authenticity and trust and, you know, then building more pro building more businesses that help solve the problems of that authenticity and right. trust that you've built. Do you, do you think this kind of authenticity, cause you're, I mean, as far as I know a lot of business coaches, especially in the fitness space, and there's very few of them that actually still operate or have a close finger on the facility that maybe started it all. And so do you think you keeping that facility kind of leads more to that authenticity? Because my guess is you've built it in a way where you could sell it to someone. There's, there's good systems, there's good people, there's good everything. But do you hang on to that because it helps kind of build more of that trust and authenticity? Because, hey, I still, you know, I still got to make sure my gym produces leads every, every month. Or is it just at this point, like, a great asset that you, you like having. It's interesting. Um, I was, I had uh, a conversation with one of the gym owners in my CEO mastermind and you know, he knows that you know majority of my time is spent on the consulting business, mm -hmm. and, you know, the personal brand and the agency and all that. Right? He knows that and understands that. And I'm, and I'm, and again, I'm very, you know, I am very open and honest too, with where the business is at the gym. Like I tell people like our revenue is not, at the same as it was back when I was running the gym. Like I'm full of guy. Mm -hmm. What I don't do is ever like lie about stuff. Right. Um, but he had a conversation and he'd be like, I've been coaching him for a really long time. And he's like, I wouldn't care if you didn't own a gym. He was like, and this is a guy that like, you know, they care about that stuff. And I was almost shocked mm -hmm. to hear him say that, but he was like, nah, I was like, dude, I, I know, you know, you're, what you're doing and you know, business and stuff and you don't need a gym to be able to coach me. Um, so at one point it's like, I, you know, I've been doing it for 15 years and I'm doing it for the last five and helping people. So I, I am almost more entrenched in it than ever because of all the gym owners I'm helping. So the mm -hmm. fact that I have, um, still a, an existing gym, it's a bonus. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think people would leave the mastermind if I didn't own a gym, but the reality right. of it is it's a, I'm an entrepreneur yeah, and I have an asset that makes money. Right. So like, why am I going to like, you know, and uh -huh. you never, you know, I've helped, uh, you know, I've helped, um, 
you know, many, not, I wouldn't say many, I felt a small, I said, there's my authenticity, right? <laughs> I went, that was my market. They're like, yeah, I felt a few, a small handful of gym owners sell their business. And one of the guys sold for, I think he sold for a multiple of, he ended up selling for uh, like two and a half million or something like that. Um, I've never heard of a sale in, in our was space. That, in, that was in the right? gym world? Yep. In our, in a small micro gym space, just huh. like your gym, just like my right. gym. Uh, I think it ended up being four times EBITDA. Um, so he had a successful wow. gym. That's a good, um, yeah, so, that's a good sales yeah, price. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. So I helped him negotiate, you know, that and I wrote, I wrote, the, I wrote the letter for him, um, and everything like that, which was really fun and really cool. So they can be, they, they can be sold. There are situations where they can be sold for good amounts of money. Um, but at the end of the day, I look at it, I'm in the back right now of my gym. I have an office. Of, so we have three businesses in one facility. So I have my consulting mm -hmm. business, which has on the other side of a sales guy, right? And I have my marketing assistant on the other side, right? Um, so we have a whole headquarters uh, in the consulting business here. I got the gym out there. Right. I have a phys physical therapist that rents space that pays money. I have the grit athlete performance that runs out of the other facility over there. It's kind of like we have like our hub here and then mm -hmm. kiss marketing is run out of San Antonio. So there's a headquarters in San Antonio, Texas. Um, right. But in terms of this, it's like we have our, you know, thing is working right now. Um, my kids train here, you know, my kids train at, at grit. You know, my wife trains at the gym. My wife would be pissed at me if I sold the gym. Right. She's like, where would I train? <laughs> right. um, so right. again, it, it, I can't say that I wouldn't sell it at some point, you know. Um, I might. I don't know. But it, at this point, it's like, you know, it's uh, it's an asset. And it's, it's um, a, a lab for me for testing stuff, and right. testing marketing ideas and, you know, and everything like that. Um, so... I guess that's uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> do you still yeah do you still do you still direct the marketing for your gym and kind of give guidance there, or do you have kind of now a marketing director that handles the marketing calendar and day to day operations with that? Yeah, yeah, we have a you have a director, someone that directs the marketing, uh, and I serve as an advisor. Um, but I've created so many assets over the years; a lot of our marketing is reused mm -hmm. assets. Right. So we built it. So for example, right. you know, we're running a campaign right now called 50 strong, which is like our January challenge. Well, I wrote the emails years ago and they're using the exact same right. emails this time we're using the, we obviously kiss marketing runs our ads, right? Um, we're using the mm -hmm. exact play. It's all there. Right. So there's a lot of systems in place that are there that doesn't require me to do that much. Cause I did it a while ago. Um, yeah, and probably there'll be times where I'll need to do facelift stuff. Um, but I don't, um, you know, I don't, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't spend a ton of time. I don't spend a ton of time mm -hmm. there at all. It's usually stuff I would want to do versus stuff I would need to mm -hmm. do. Um, so, but yeah, there's, there's people that are running the show. Yeah. Love it. As a gym owner, Coach Catalyst is the key to having low turnover. For several years, I struggled and spent 10 to 20 hours a week communicating with clients via phone calls, Facebook Messenger, email, and text messages. I had tried everything to make my life more efficient. I was at my wit's end. And then I found Coach Catalyst. Since starting the software, I have found a life again, and my clients are thanking me for being so involved in their fitness life. I've cut my daily commitment to interacting with over 300 clients to under 15 minutes a day and have streamlined my six-week challenges. I couldn't recommend it more. I just don't know if I would even be here today if it wasn't for Coach Catalyst. If you don't have an account already, you're missing out and not helping the people you could be. So if you're, if you are a, <clears throat> maybe advising a coach who's heavily involved in training and they're looking at maybe learning more about the business side and outside of reading your books and doing all of that kind of stuff, which is, I think, a great place to start. Are there other marketers or other books that you would recommend to that kind of early coach that's just getting their feet wet in the business side of things, especially around sales and marketing? Yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, so if, I mean, I always have to recommend Think and Grow Rich, right? As you know. Yeah. Um, 
by Napoleon Hill. I just, the story of the book is pretty incredible. Um, and I think you, in order to have an education on business, you got to have an education around wealth and money and, and all of that. Um, so that would probably be, you know, uh, number one, uh, from the sales and marketing standpoint, I'm a, I'm a Kennedy guy, right? Mm -hmm. I've been raised in that world and, um, it's, it's interesting, you know, you know, when Michael Jackson died, my wife was like crying. Right. And I didn't get it. I didn't really understand like why I was like, you never met Michael Jackson. You know, why the hell are you crying? Mm -hmm. And, uh, Dan Kennedy, who's been my mentor for a long time. I've never met him, but I have listened to thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of his audio tapes and CDs and, and read every one of his books. And like, just, I, 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 I I've never met him, but I know him. like mm -hmm. it's my guy. And he essentially, this is the old, and I don't know if you know the story, but he essentially was on his deathbed in hospice and wrote a piece of copy on his deathbed that I'll never forget. And he wrote a blog. It basically says the first line of it was, I find myself in the unusual position of regretfully announcing my death. And I'm like, holy cow, like even on this guy's about to die and he still is writing amazing copy. I was like, that's one of the most incredible thing I've ever read in my entire <laughs> life. I found myself in the unusual position. I'll never forget it. I found myself in the unusual position for regretfully announcing my death. And then he didn't die. He like, and now he's like still out teaching. Like it's crazy. And um, I was legitimately upset and I wrote him a letter and everything because they were saying like, write this guy a letter because he's about to die. And I wrote a letter and I like poured into it and I was like legitimately upset. But I mean, Dan Kennedy in his books and without ever meeting him has taught me more, more about business than any one I've ever learned from combined. And, you know, he's an old crotchety <laughs> asshole, but <laughs> he is an absolute business genius. And, um, he is the ultimate realist and man, I have gotten so much value. So I guess I would say, get into that world. And the cool thing is, you know, he's connected with Russell Brunson from click funnels. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, Russell Brunson bought the business and they're now doing stuff together. Um, so if you, that's, that's honestly where I would be going. Um, it's a really good book. No one knows about, um, called uh the road less stupid by a guy named keith cunningham um which is probably one of the better books i've ever read um in business and uh that guy is also really good um but honestly the other thing is too i'd be uh i'd get people engaged in tony robbins's stuff um mm -hmm. you know the number one chokehold on a business is the psychology of the owner Mm -hmm. And if you think that not mastering your own psychology is important for business growth, you are severely mistaken, right? This is about what people deciding not to raise prices is not a business problem. It is a psychological problem. Mm -hmm. It is, a, is an emotional problem, an emotional issue that you're bringing into the business. And so if you want to get better at business, start learning about yourself, start knowing about yourself and start learning about, you know, why you decide yeah. to do the things you do or don't the things you do. So we could talk about business all day long, but at the end of the day, it's all about your mind. I, and I, that's so true. And I think one of the challenges about our industry, right. Is we're not selling widgets, right. We're not just selling something to random people and you know, it's easy to, Hey, let's increase this by 50% to, or by 50 cents to increase our margins or whatever. It's you have, it's clients become friends, right. I've had clients that have trained with me for 10 years um, yeah. and have helped me build my business. And so it's like, you view it almost like their family more than like, it's a business, but that ultimately becomes a demise because you can't make clear business decisions when you're in that space. And so I 100% agree with you that the mental work to get around that. Cause that is probably one of, when you say, when you tell a group of trainers, Hey, you need to raise more, you need to raise your prices. Everyone's gonna be like, Oh, I can't do that. I can't, everyone's going to leave. I'm not gonna have any clients left. They're all going to, and then you do it and no one leaves and you become more profitable and you can run a better business, provide better service experience and all that. But yeah, you're spot on, man. Spot on. Cool.
Yeah. No, that's uh, the thing is what we do as business coaches is provide fresh eyes. You know, that's, that's really an important thing of, of, you know, I was out with San Diego and there's with the CEO mastermind and there's things that, you know, they bring to the table that are so obvious to me. And it's just like, Mm -hmm. well, this is like, why, why did you not even think about it? And they're like, Oh, that's a really good idea. And I'm not like, all these guys are probably smarter than me. Like, I just like, I was just not like, I'm just not in your business. And you know, like we had a guy, we had a guy who wanted to, you know, this is, this is actually very important. He was a one-on-one guy that had did some semi-private and, but he was mostly one-on-one and he gets up there and it's like, I want to do 60,000 a month in one. And, and I want to, I need to get to 80 one-on-one members to do it. And I was like, Oh, that sounds like a freaking really bad idea. And he's like, I was like, how many small group members you got? He's like nine. I was like, how many sessions are you doing? He was like 23 a week. I'm like all right so you got like one person new session dude um so you you can either get you know uh seven to eighty one-on-one members and drive up your you know your payroll so high that you almost make no money or you can right. take the existing money that you're paying for the sessions fill the 40 empty spots that you've got and put in pure profit into your business as opposed to a big headache of one-on-one sessions and managing a bunch of people like it was just so obvious Mm -hmm. and that it's not that i'm more intelligent than them or anything like that it is just i have fresh eyes in their business i'm not emotionally attached i'm not emotionally involved in their business and i was just like okay like this is what you do Mm -hmm. and they're like oh and they look at me like i'm a genius like oh man i'm like no it's just 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 because i'm not in your business (laughs) right yeah (laughs) I, and I think that's that's the value of, of masterminds, right? I've been part of masterminds since I started coaching. And it's probably been the reason I was able to build businesses is being around other people that were ahead of me. So I am very competitive. And so I want to kind of chase them. But then also to bring your problems to the table and let someone who isn't emotionally invested in your business to just tell you how it is. And then yeah. you just go out and do it. Um and so, yeah, man, this is, this is awesome. So I want to finish up with some just kind of rapid fire stuff. Um, maybe you saw the little document I sent, but maybe you didn't. And it's actually more fun if you didn't. Did. So I'm just going to throw a few at you and you let me know uh, what you got. So the first one is taco, burrito, or quesadilla? Burrito last night. Burrito, like Chipotle burrito, or like a specialty, like Mexican burrito. So I'll, t- I'll tell you about a burrito. So we were out in San Diego, and we went to the. So this isn't rapid fire, but this is it was worth it. Um, it's all right. Joe Joe Hashi and I went to. This is you told me it's long form, so I could go long. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's called the Pacific Coast Grill in Encinitas or Carlsbad, right on the water. Beautiful place. Okay. Um. They had a surf and turf burrito, steak and shrimp. Uh, just like one of the most best. I just had it a couple of days ago. And so I'm on like this burrito kick. So last night, the kids were home and I made burritos for everybody. So it's like definitely burrito on my mind. So burrito. All right. <laughs> I love it. Um, what's a purchase you've made uh, for $100 or less that has had profound impact or provided profound value in your life. So something relatively inexpensive, but has provided exponential return. Uh, Anything come to mind? I mean, any book, any book, uh, I guess if you want a specific book, um, I'll call it Kennedy's wealth book. What is it? What's the name of it? Do you the know? wealth book. The top of your head? Yeah. Wealth, wealth attraction. The wealth book. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, actually I have it right here. I always have it on me. Uh, wealth attraction in the new economy. Are you a book gifter? Do you gift books to people at all? I do. Yeah. What's the um, book you've gifted most? So I have a few different ones. Uh, so I have, um, if, if, like, uh, it depends on the, uh, the event. Um, if someone gets engaged, I give them the five love languages. If someone mm-hmm. starts a business, I give them the E myth. Mm-hmm. If someone um, is in business for a while, I give them traction. Mm-hmm. If someone gets married, I give them love and respect. 
That's and awesome. yeah, this is a system that's set up to like literally uh, my um, the operation the Amanda who runs our operations at FBU. If someone has a baby, they know that actually if oh, they have a baby boy. It's uh, I think there's a Navy SEAL book. Um, it's like a parenting father, and then mm -hmm. the, if they have a daughter, shopping. it's uh, what a difference a daddy makes. Right, so we have a whole system around books gift giving. That's awesome. Yeah, based on the the theme. That's yeah. the the cool thing about the books too is when you give it to somebody, not only does it provide a ton of value for them because it can help them on the stage that they're at right now, but every time they open it, they're going to think of you too. So it's kind of that gift that like just keeps on keeps on giving. So that's awesome, yeah. man. All right, uh, what cartoon world do you wish you could live in for a week? Cartoon world. Where would you live? Who were you obsessed uh, with as a child? What cartoon world were you obsessed I with? I really, as a child? I really liked He Man. I guess I don't know what that says about me, but yeah, <laughs> I guess that's well, the you answer became to a the question. All right, I guess that's the answer to the question. <laughs> uh, I love it, man. Um, all right. So if people want to find out a little bit more about what you're doing, I know you've got some free books out there. Where can people find out everything about Vince Gabriel? Yeah. Um, VinceGabriel.com. You can get a free copy of my book at VinceGabriel.com. You can book a marketing strategy call there. You can do a lot there. That's probably the easiest place to send people cool. um, to get info. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure it's in the show notes too. Um, but man, Vince, it's always a pleasure speaking with you and I can't wait till uh, we're in person the next time. For sure. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. You guys are doing great work and, you know, appreciate knowing you for so many years and, you know, I know you guys are helping a ton of people as well. So keep up. You guys are doing awesome. Keep it up. Appreciate it. Vince, thanks. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of the Coach Catalyst podcast. If you are a coach looking to do more for your clients than just workouts, give Coach Catalyst a test drive. Try it for 14 days. Jump on call with your personal strategy coach, Ashley, and see how easy technology can be, all for free. Tell them Trevor sent you. Until next time, keep changing lives. What's up, guys? Thanks so much for listening. Do me a favor and go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. This way you'll get notified when we get new episodes come out. And if you really, really loved it, I'd truly appreciate it if you left us a five-star rating. So thanks so much. If you're looking for more free stuff uh, from me, head over to vincesfreebook.com. You'll get a free copy of my marketing book. And just head over to vincesfreebook.com and I'll send you a copy. Thanks.